very, very special presentation here. Very glad you guys could make it. Hope you guys all had yourselves a good uh, fall break here. And uh, sometimes there's a tradition in these sorts of events where you always have an introduction to a speaker, but we're going to have an introduction to the person who's going to give the introduction. <laughs> and um, that, that's appropriate because uh, Dr. Jan Raymer is the Vice President and Director of the Wilds and a very, very important partner of ours in terms of providing a lot of things for the school, but a lot of opportunities for you guys as students. And it's everything from opportunities to work at the Wilds. A lot of people work down there as tour guides. Uh, people come on in terms of uh, some of the internship programs, service learning programs. Uh, the, the Wilds is, provides a hugely important partnership for us. So I wanted to take the opportunity then to introduce her uh, because um, the, this thing that we have in a relationship with the Wilds is a really, really, really unique and wonderful benefit. So, um, Dr. Jan Raymer received her undergraduate degree in 1978. You have to get the year. <laughs> <laughs> I did mine right about okay. then. <laughs> uh, and then um, from Purdue, and then she went on uh, to work as a zookeeper for a number of years, about a dozen years, yeah. and then she decided to go to vet school, and she went to the University of Wisconsin, and uh, come on in, folks, don't be shy. So she graduated in 1995, yep. okay, um, and then worked as a zoo veterinarian at the Indianapolis Zoo for a number of years, but then um, um, I got my I got my bio information from the Zanesville uh, Times, oh, the geez. Ace of Trades. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and um, from there, as I understand it, you you um, saw a opportunity to go to Rwanda, where you had been years before. And so I guess in 2011, you 2000, 2009. 2009, got that wrong. Okay, <laughs> uh, went to uh, Rwanda to join the Gorilla Doctors Program, and she was there. Um, came back here in 2015 to yep. assume the position as the Director of Conservation Medicine here. Right. And then in 2017 became Vice President and Director of the WAS. So we are very, very glad to have you with us here. And thank you for providing our formal introduction to the talk. So Dr. Thanks. Van Raymer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> It's really an honor to be here, and I too just want to confirm the, the, the wonderful partnership that we have with Muskingum University. We do have apprenticeships available. A, a lot of uh, your students have come out and done bird projects and various other projects. You may not know this, but our relationship with Muskingum University goes way back because Jack Hanna was a student here oh so many years ago and actually met his wife here. So, um, and some of you youngsters may not know who he is. Does everybody know who Jack Hanna is? Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, so yeah, our relationship goes way back. And also, um, for those of you that are interested, we're going to be hosting the uh, Muskingum University is going to be hosting our second uh, conservation science symposium in March. And I think we're close to honing in on a date. And so I hope to see you all there. That will be uh, a lot of uh, presentations of good work that has been done through uh, resources at the <coughs> Wild. But we're here today to hear Dr. Bernard Sebede. Bernard is the uh, head veterinarian for Gorilla Doctors in Uganda. I've known him and worked with him since 2009. Um, he ha was a game warden in Uganda for two of the uh, national parks that house mountain gorillas and then joined Gorilla Doctors and has been with Gorilla Doctors for 12 years. Yeah, 12 years, yes. yes. Yeah. So Bernard is a, a, a wonderful veterinarian, a teacher, and a, a dear friend. He's here with his wife, Sylvia, in, in the back there, who is the administrator for Gorilla Doctors in Uganda. So it just, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bernard. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Jane Jan, I've since met Jane and probably can pronounce your name right now. <laughs> yeah, we, I think what I've had so far is the issue of partnerships. My story and my travel and talks and people I've met is really through the partnership and understanding that at least in our part of the world, you can hardly do anything alone. If you want to do something 
tangible one to do it well and good it's really important that you look for partnership with other people that you can together do do it alone so that the same applies to the mountain gorilla conservation i don't know if you know mountain gorillas can i pull up my my presentation please so i need to yeah do you have a point Oh, that should be the one. Yes. So, mountain goya as, as a species is one that came from the brink of extinction, if you have learned about extinction of species, to now a thriving population. So, by 1991, when the parks where mountain goya live were gazetted as national parks, the population of these animals was as low as 300 individuals. As we talk, at least a thousand individuals exist. That has been because of the tremendous work of so many conservation agencies, so many conservation partners, including the work of Goya doctors in saving some individuals that would otherwise have died. So they came from being few in number, so they were classified as endangered, critically endangered actually. Now they have just been down listed to endangered, but still remain threatened to a population that we think can remain viable and survive provided all other threats are addressed as you as you as you learn so the area i want to emphasize here is that this is a species that has gone from extinction threat i've seen so many species at the wilds which are already extinct in their natural habitats and only in zoos and in sanctuaries so this save this species was saved from going that drain was still there were no mountain goyas in captivity in any zoos any sanctuary anywhere in the world so all mountain goyas were living in the forest so if they were to disappear there would be no fallback population to think about as it is with some other species which already extinct in their world habitats but can be reintroduced from captive uh, animals that's not the case with mountain goyas number two to a species that was almost useless in the sense of the local people who were living in the area in the interest of their own agriculture, their own livelihood, their own food and so on. To a species that is now technically supporting the national economy. You see the economy of the government is heavily relying on money from mountain gorillas. That's what mountain gorillas have changed to be. Gorillas are in several species, you might know, you might not. We have what we call the Western Lowland Gorillas on the western side of Africa. We have the Cross River Gorilla, basically between Nigeria and the Cameroon boundary. The Mountain Gorillas are in Further East, Rwanda, Uganda and Congo, DRC. DRC is Democratic Republic of Congo. And then the Growers Gorillas, which are only found in, in DRC. But for the gorilla doctors, we are working with these two species. Mostly mountain gorillas, but recent also growers gorillas, because they are facing the same threats that mountain gorillas were facing before. If you are interested in knowing their populations, as in the western island gorillas are quite many, estimated to be in at least uh, tens of thousands, and there are many in zoos. I saw some in Columbus Zoo. The Cross River Gorillas are very few, only about 300, none in any zoo, anywhere. The Mountain Gorillas, about a thousand now, and the Growers Gorillas, last census, several years ago, were in 4,000, but now it's made to be in below 2,000, and the area where they are is extremely vulnerable in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are so many uh, fighting and rebel activity and so no census can go on so their true numbers cannot be assisted until the security situation in the area is is normalized mountain goa live in two populations one population is in bwindi entirely in bwindi another one in the virunga bwindi is this area if you look at the google map this dark part is a forest that is bwindi and this other one is the virungas if i stretch it out this is how it looks like so they live in two Subpopulations: one in Ibuin, the entire in Uganda, another one in the Virunga, shared by Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo. So three countries. But of course, the animal, the goyas will move across borders. They don't know these borders. These are artificial borders. What is important in that area is that the human population, people who live, local people in the area, is one of the densely populated areas of Uganda, up to 500 and more people per square kilometers. 
So the pressure on land to expand the agricultural field is too much. And so by the time government gazetted the areas to save them as national parks, they had really cleared a big chunk of that and so remain only small a small portion of forest and when you go you see a very sharp boundary from crop fields right into the park and that comes with its own challenges. One of which is that increased human gorilla interaction. So the gorillas will always move out of the forest uh, to forage on corn and other food crops but also people use some path, food path along which they used to use along and along they will meet gorillas and because these are habituated meaning they are used to people they are used to routine you know you meet them see them they don't do anything you can just see them and there's nothing there's a process to habituation so these are really habituated to to human beings so they are used not yet tamed tamed would be different there's habituation taming and then domestication cattle are domesticated they won't do anything a cattle is way bigger than you but you can just tap it and it will move on a tamed animal can be a tiger or a lion in a zoo you play with it but still is wild but these are habituated not yet to the point of taming and that's where we don't want to go anyway so they move out interact with the people go to cornfields but they're endangered they need protection and they are extremely vulnerable to some of our diseases and that's where the concern comes from there's a lot of contact direct and indirect Direct one would be when a gorilla comes and touches you because of something or anything, doesn't fear you, don't fear it, maybe it sees you as a playmate, you can play with it and so on, it will come and touch you, that's really direct. Indirect, you can throw your pen, your paper or something or like this, PDA which was picked by a gorilla, so you don't know what was on that PDA and then when a gorilla gets it and this one is biting onto the stylus, so that is direct but came from indirect with this interaction with it from towards human research and so on so those contacts is largely what we want to avoid now because we know that in as much as government came in and protected the forests no more encroachment no more poaching at least in uganda and rwanda no more uh, most of the activities are handled save for the poaching for antelopes where the issue comes in but now the biggest threat we think about when we talk about mountain gorillas is human disease or diseases that are, can come from people to which they are naive and therefore can be dangerous for a number of years when i started vet school even the thing about intervention or treating in world populations was not largely thought about the thinking was really nature can take its course in the natural environment so animals have lived in the parks in the world on their own they fall sick those which can survive go on. those which can't will go off and it's really survival for the fittest that's what our teaching in that time ecology was but it has since changed we think about interventions because some of the threats the causes of those uh, issues we talk about are human caused or if we don't do it and if we do nothing some of the forces can be beyond the ability of the animals to survive and therefore unless we intervene we can completely lose them so now things of because then we're talking about captive if you have an animal in captivity is you got it from the forest and therefore you must take care of it it's ethically responsible you take care of it welfare but in the world we're talking about well there are thousands of animals and therefore if we lose one to a lion a tiger or something a poacher that's normal they will come on but now we look at a population as small as 300 400 individuals in the world to sustain that population really need a very individual to stay alive and therefore you do anything you can't save it genetically you think if this population is to survive that genetic mix is really really important if you have too much in breeding and you don't allow that genetic mix again you get other issues you learn all those in biology but also what's our knowledge about carrying capacity we know okay fine we have a population we are trying to boost up but we don't know when we shall be really at a level where we no longer care and maybe now yeah, we have a few thousands no much worries but we think the forest can still handle much more based on the books we have read the papers we have read about those early researchers and early people who used to move to visit these areas before us where do they used to find gorillas where do we find them now so we think there's still room for for population increase so we don't necessarily treat in all cases gorillas fight each other all the time as in the world you know animals can be but sometimes we just observe you say gorillas may be injured by its uh, fighting for dominance in a group or another group want to take over the other group 
One of them is badly injured, but you observe it today, tomorrow, and sometimes you see the wound clearly healing and healing well without any treatment or intervention, and you don't do anything. It will just heal on its own. But when you see the wounds getting infected, getting necrotic, starting and go and start to lose condition, no longer feeding, staying behind the group, you see it's really going down because of this injury. Then we are forced to come in and treat that girl. Even when that injury is natural, caused by one goiter fighting another goiter versus an injury caused by a human being trying to hunt for a dike and gets a goiter trapped. Sometimes we see uh, physical uh, like uh, snares or this guy was trapped in a pole. As a vet you can just go dart it with an uh, anesthetic and get it removed but these rangers just get a pole, push it over and you don't know, we try to minimize as much intervention as we can wherever we can. So it's about our intervention but we don't always do that. We age and group go it as in two different categories and we identify and know each and every individual in the entire population of the habituated ones. So we know each individual, the age, male, female, all of them, and that's important for monitoring. Because if I treated one today, unless I can identify it more, how will I do the follow-up? How will I know how it's doing? And so even when you go to monitor, I know this group has 20 individuals. I must really see and all the 20, that's when I can rule that the group is fine, everybody is well. But if I don't even know how to identify who is who, I may not be able to make a ruling on that group. And then when interpreting some of our surveillance data. We look at some of these parameters, give us an idea of how we are doing as a population. We look at interventions we do, which age group do we intervene in the most, and where does it, that, what, how does that count in terms of saving a population or contribution I mean look at adult females versus silverbacks or adult males if you saved more females and those females gave birth then you're really adding to the population a much bigger proportion so we look at some of these data snare removals we intervene when you're removing snares snares are set by people so if you look at why should people continue to say snares for dikers and antelopes it's for food unless there's an intervention in the communities to sensitize and why they shouldn't do that. Or maybe if they have an alternative. They will continue to go to the park to sell these snares. So we look at these trends, can tell us what's happening. And so our intervention should translate into some of the results. We have groups, other than we are doctors, who work with local people to change attitude, to look for alternatives. How are they doing? If we continue to see illegal activities happening in the forest, the same way they have been, even for those groups, then we can say maybe your interventions are not doing well enough so some of these parameters tells us that look at this 50 percent more than that are infants infant mortality rate is very high so the population growth will be very slow because you are losing many of the young ones but what's the main cause trauma is one of the major causes is this something we can stop something we can control if yes well and good if not then you look at because some of the causes, like uh, trauma caused by interaction with other groups, is very hard to control. Go as we continue to interact, we continue to fight, and the young ones will become victims. But when we look at respiratory disease, go against a uh, flu, coughs, and dies, yeah, that becomes a concern to us because we want to know where does this infection come from? Is it from people? Is it from somewhere and that's, that gives us concern and so we look at those points where we think we can make a good intervention. I talked about snares, where us fight with each other, injure themselves. If we see wounds which are bad and they, we think they can't survive on their own, or we see goiters starting to get down the drain because of those wounds getting infected, we come in and treat and try to save those individuals. If we see them healing, fine and good. So some are too bad, you just have saving to amputate. And these are goiters which if you did nothing, you get a hand in a snare, gangrene comes in, gets infected, either that individual will not survive. But if you come and maybe hand is already too necrotic, clean it up, cut it up, amputate. Yeah, some wounds are so bad, like this is a head injury. How can you survive an infection on a head injury if there is no treatment so it's this kind of wound if you don't do anything and gets infected you are likely to lose that individual so we come in even save such individuals uh, as i've said groups will fight each other sometimes we do intervene sometimes we do not but one of the reasons we do is some of these groups are tourist groups towards twice visit these groups and they have booked well way years and months in advance and the park authorities are going to say if we lose these groups if we lose a silverback we might lose the entire group 
And then for those visitors to us who booked to, to come and visit, what do we tell them? We won't refund money and so on. The business aspect comes in and so also come in in such cases. Infectious disease, we never know what the cause of infection is. In such cases, we definitely have to look to intervene, take samples to the lab and find out what's happening. These abscesses, you get a big wound and pass and so on. What's happening? These are uh, viruses. Scabies, scabies is here. I don't know if you have scabies here, but it's a mange, it's a mite. You know, it's some, you call it mange. Yeah, something which may not be seen, but uh, this was, this particular case was a mange mite from a dog. From It's a dog mite, which came to Goyas and was causing lots of issues. Though they don't have to go back to the communities and think about how to take care of their dog. And they vaccinate, they, I mean, give a, uh, uh, Parasite treatment, so those are interventions we do. Respiratory infections are always our concern. We never know where that flu is coming from. We have many, many respiratory issues these days, if you think about it, from ordinary flu, to things like SARS or MERS. And uh, historically, if you know, flu is keep, keeps on evolving from what we knew, the pandemic flus, to now we talk of highly pathogenic avian influenza or bad flu. So we think if such came to goyas, the way it affects people, it will affect the same goyas. So the population is extremely vulnerable. So in that cases, we definitely go and find out, but also enforce rules keeping distance uh, between people and goyas. If you must visit, stay distance. If you are sick, step back. If you need to cough, cover your nose, cover your mouth with a hanky, things like that make a difference. And so, Others, we just see happening like a Goya can fall from a tree, that can happen, silverback fell from a tree and died, that's nothing can do. A cancer of different organs, we see those these days, maybe because we have the ability to detect and uh, rule in the lab that this is a cancer. So some of these, uh, we also see, so in essentially whatever is abnormality we see from the normal we expect we must go in and investigate and see what's happening as i've said we do interventions to save individuals because that's good for the population but also we do interventions that are sometimes hard this case i just put as an example we had a goida which was really losing condition very sick we don't see exactly what's happening the rest of the group is fine we look at it, see egg count, parasite egg count. We think there's a lot of worms, and that's so. So we just got the wormers as you do with your dogs and cat, and they go in the next few weeks is bright and shining and as well. So sometimes we do some of these, which would otherwise never think about because all, like, all animals have worms, but we can't treat the entire world, you know. But if this particular one is really going and we don't know and we think we can save it and if we can really tell that we think it has a high burden, one burden and we have the dwarmers, why not go in and treat it and get it saved? So that's how we have come to save some of these individuals and contribute to that population we are now talking about. So if you interested, we, we have just analyzed, we have said the goals have increased since 30 years ago from about 300 to about a thousand but at least 50 percent of that increase is because of the veterinary interventions that we have been doing so the individuals that we saved that would otherwise die they have contributed at least 50 percent of the growth we are seeing so they grew at about four percent per year but again as i've said those interventions have made a difference if there were no interventions maybe it would be a different scenario a different story that's what this illustration shows as i told you the health of the employees and people who get in contact with those gorillas is as important when you think about gorilla health in, th in terms of disease transmission. Yourself who is going to get in contact every day in a short distance, you need to be healthy. So we have employee health programs where we screen our employees and partners, porters, rangers, vets, researchers for their own health status and say you need to be healthy. We tell twice, if you are sick, don't go to goilers. But how can we ourselves go to goilers when we are sick? But then rangers tell you, well, if I'm sick, but I need treatment. So you must improvise and work with the government and to support that component and make sure you have a healthy workforce going first before you even come to the twice and demand that you must be vaccinated, you must not be sick, because we want to keep at least we know for sure that that's where our most challenge comes from. So we have, uh, I talked about the mange which came from dogs. 
So domestic animal program again partnering with other institutions, other people to, to promote uh, uh, responsible care for our pets, get pets vaccinated. We had too many feral dogs around Mugainga. The issues of rabies come in and so we get concerned. Well, we see these rabies in dogs and people and what if a dog beat a gorilla and a gorilla gets rabies and beats another one and so on? What are we going to do about that? It's easier to vaccinate and register pets in the area and educate people, vaccinate. Some of these are the interventions we really do that are accessory but equally important to, to the conservation. We have a biobank, we do lots of research. As I've told you, we are based out of a university system. And so at the university, we must do really research. But some of the research is done by, again, students like you who identify interest pick projects, pick interest, come and do research on any subject, any science that is contributing to knowledge, first of all, but also solving a problem that we might have. Problems are like antimicrobial resistance. You treat an animal with antibiotics not responding because the drugs you are using are already abused and can no longer work. That's, works, that's what happens with antibiotics. So in research into most of those areas, we work with many researchers, many institutions, many students, to provide opportunities, sometimes to access samples that we have kept in the freezers from as way back as 1986. If you need to do a research and you need to look at blood, you need blood from gorillas, you need 100 blood samples, there's no way you're going to get a permit to that 100 gorillas and collect samples. But if you know we have these in our biobank and you apply and the permit and so on, you can access those samples and do really, really important work. That's the collaboration I was talking about. Some of what we know in terms of knowledge has come out of these collaborations with individual researchers, with the zoos. We are going to treat the drugs we are using. The zoos have access to gorillas every day and they practice this and they, they, they inform us if they are having something we don't know. So by collaboration with the zoos like Columbus, we get some of the information also, also from them. So we feed into each other. That's the value of the collaboration. We take care of orphans. These gorillas have also come at a stage where the they are often is because of dead mothers or, or pet trade. In the early 2000, there was a, a massive demand for gorilla babies. We don't know where it came from. The uh, speculation was from Eastern Asia, from Asia. And so some people were luring local people to kill gorillas and bring babies for a fee, maybe as little as $200. And so to get a baby, you're going to kill the silver back, you're going to kill the mother, maybe you're going to kill five individuals of the family to access a baby. So when those babies would come out, previously, there were items to introduce them, take them to the group where they came from. <coughs> but any baby below three years never survived. And the items to bring gorillas to zoos before, mountain gorillas to zoos, they were also never uh, successful. So we didn't have any gorillas in captivity, we convinced the park authorities that with our expertise and our knowledge from zoo collaboration, we have what it takes to hand raise some of these babies. And that's what we did. So when those babies were confiscated, other instances, these are gorillas who were killed in Congo by rebels. They came and shot gorillas, seven of them, and some had babies and we found babies hanging to the bodies of their mothers. If you left them there, they would die. So we got them out, hand raised them, and they survived. So we have Gorillas in captivity, not in a zoo, but in a sanctuary specifically, which was created for that purpose, both mountain gorillas and, low, and lowland gorillas. And those gorillas with time have increased and have become a huge family. And they are now separated between the growers and the mountain gorillas. Now the debate is whether we should take them to the park or not, but depending on which si side of conservation you come from, you may say, yes, that's right, that's not, and also from the science. So that's how the science and conservation of gorillas has evolved over the years. But most important, as I told you, for me, the mountain gorilla story is from a species that was almost going to a species that is now vibrant, but supporting the national economy. We have to go and see gorillas, you need to buy a permit of up to $1,500 to see gorillas for one hour. And that is supporting the entire economy, 50% of the tourism revenue is coming from gorilla tourism. So when you add that, it means the governments are going to demand to habituate more groups to get maybe more money. Maybe to increase the number of people that can visit a family. Currently there's only eight, maximum eight people per day, per group, for one hour. The demand for the money and the, the, the it's going, they are going to demand maybe why don't we take 10 or 15 people. 
But our science, our researchers advise that way, well, maybe to keep risk low, keep the numbers controlled, keep the numbers regulated. That's why we need researchers and scientists, and that's the information we use to convince government that it's safer to be safe than to try and go for money and then maybe even lose the resource that we think we are we, we are take, trying to take advantage of. So this is a speed that was almost going, that now we think is okay. If we can especially eliminate the issue of disease because we think and we know definitely they are as vulnerable as we are to disease and therefore we think we can sustain it. So the, the Goya Doctors program, as you might already know, uh, is in three countries in Africa and Central Africa and so that means you have to cross borders sometimes and that means you have to have a passport and get your passport stamped. Those logistical challenges come in in implementation of some of our work. There are three independent governments and that must be taken care of. So you must have vets everywhere to respond to and the actual emergencies actually to all these groups across the region. So we have 12 vets in the region. We are dealing with two subspecies as I've told you, the growers gorillas and the mountain gorillas. And this project has run for about 30 years or more actually since 1986 and I had here in the, in the US at the University of California in Davis. And we have partnered with so many people, I've had so many, all our previous Vets who have come to Africa to work with Mount, they remain our advisors. Jane was our boss in Africa when she was working and she's on our advisory board. Sometimes we, have, we get complicated cases, we have to communicate. Yes, Jane, we are seeing this, what do you think? Based on our own experience, our own other zoo experience, we share information and look for the best course of action to take. So we keep these collaborations running, definitely. So the area we work as is mountainous. The volcano, Virunga. if the area of view, a plain view of that area is, is mountainous and at the peak of this mountain is where the international borders run. International borders tend to follow certain markers which are natural. So these are what you see when you are above in the plain. But if you go down from far, you'll see the mountain from far, kind of how it will look like. Mostly, uh, all the arable land is really uh, dug up for, for crop agriculture. When you get really close, those areas outside the forest, the park, completely cut for agriculture. The rest them just to rotate to get maybe better yields, but largely down. As I told, the population is the, is the most densely populated, very poor, these kind of houses. But because of tourism, some of them have gained money and they can build better houses, something like this basically from a grass thatch to an iron roof, but that doesn't really change much of the economic welfare. We say it has improved, and definitely so, but still not yet at a point where we think it is enjoyable. Sometimes we have camps for military because of, as you know, rebel activities, Eastern Congo, especially Congo, and uh, these are areas which are very vulnerable to political conflicts and rebel activities. So we get some the ranger, I mean soldier, comes in the forest when you are the forest and therefore what they do is cut up, we talk to them, but sometimes we have no control over what they do, they do whatever they want. But uh, most importantly, the social services, you will not get any running water, you won't get electricity, you won't get any of those things. So people have to go down the river at the forest edge, all the water comes from the forest. So they know the value of the forest in terms of ecosystem services. They see the rain, they know without that forest, maybe the rain will not be there. And they see the rivers coming from there. But they have to go there at the river bank, wash their clothes. This is the same drink water that's going down the river for another community to pick. So then other issues related to, to community health challenges coming. And so that's the second part of what I want to tell you about. I've worked for the last 10 years actually. Our project, Goya Doctors, was the main implement of a project that was looking at wildlife surveillance for emerging infectious diseases. These are diseases that are either increased in occurrence or are newly emerging. If you think about uh, Mabaga or Ebola or even the old ones like West Nile or Zika, these are diseases which have emerged from, from wildlife and have become pandemic of concern because they can potentially spread the whole world, the whole continent. So we have a project that has been looking at this. Most importantly, we call it the EPT project, Emerging Pandemic Threats Project. And the goal was really to prevent, detect, and control infections at their source with the knowledge that most of these are coming from wildlife. And because we are dealing with wildlife, we're university-based 
group with a team of researchers we knew we could do find what's related to emerging infections but also at the same time we have what we call the global health and security agenda in as much as the global security is now when you think about global security or health and security or travel you are going to be detected at the airport you are going to be screened for bombs or things like that but a pathogen like Ebola is as as deadly as a rifle can be in terms of affecting so many people so these pathogens could potentially be used as biological weapons so the global health social agenda is looking at making a world safer from that threat Think like anthrax and so on this program is worldwide but we are contributing to it so that's where the thought came from with our knowledge our experience we are required to now look at okay what do you think we have as a threat in this region you have been working with these samples where are they are they safe we have collected samples from primates and so on they tell us Ebola comes from monkeys or gorillas and you say you have samples in the biobank are those samples really safe what's the control in access and so on can they be accessed and used for wrong things so we have been working on this project largely to detect pathogens that we think are of important and affecting people as you might know pathogen all animals wildlife especially most of the people that have come even hiv aids they have come from mostly wildlife but the amplification is from domestic animals and when it comes to people that's what we call a speed of basically that's what i have been working on i want to give you a scenario of what it means it may not make a lot of sense to you but i hope it does the outbreak response and detection when you get an outbreak what we call an outbreak something that comes disease not the flu you are going to get to done oh this is a flu but something comes and you don't know what it is but it's infectious and you are sick usually what happens you detect a case somebody maybe may not even report and may be reported later on well i started feeling fever two days ago oh this person started feeling sick say a week ago but he's already dead and you can't even talk to him so it would take at least a week sometimes to report even detect this is not normal you get a fever you get flu you normally get flu three days you are better now you're almost a week or oh, something's wrong this flu is not going then you go to hospital it's almost a week but it could be something more deadly or dangerous that's what happens then you go to the lab typically in africa take forever to get lab results and this is where africa and actually southeast asia and that's where i had most of these issues coming from and then by the time you get a response the lab confirms so they send a response almost three weeks when the epidemic curve is going down so the people was already there people died things happened and the response team is going when it's almost dying so your opportunity to control is very very limited to because naturally the means come curve in and go down so the project was about changing that we do surveillance continuous surveillance we get routine samples if we knock down a gorilla we chimp any other animal find an animal dead take samples take to the lab we know what's happening so that when a first case comes we're already prepared we have the detection system in place we have the lab people trained we have the reagents to do the testing we have systems in place to deal with it that reduces the response time so the opportunity to control is big we have got that we have got several outbreaks in uganda which stops at one case or two but we say Ebola in west africa which spread to three countries twenty thousand people because of systems once you don't have systems in place to detect early and respond early you get it run out of control that's what we have in congo now five thousand people Ebola infected in uganda in, in that case came in uganda we have systems already detected early controlled that makes a big sense this is the project i've been working on and for that for biology students or want to environment and so on anything to do with the disease causation they are usually three things they will tell you pathogen host environment so we want to understand those factors which lead to that not everybody who gets a virus will possibly fall sick why why would i fall sick and not you and which environment where would that be and also looking at the risk where is the risk highest if we think about controlling emerging infectious diseases like Marburg, ebola zika those kind of diseases avian influenza that's what the project was doing about it was targeted because all our research all previous research has shown that 
majority, actually 75% of these diseases I'm talking about have originated from wildlife. But only from three main taxa, only from non-human primates, bats and rodents. So we target our sampling to those three. These other taxa very low. They, and this is based on the proportion of viruses, natural viruses that share between people and these animals. In terms of risk, if you interact with a bat or a primate, you are likely to get a disease that is going to affect you than what you do if you did with zebras or hares or rabbits or dogs or cats. This is already proven science. So our surveillance has been targeting the three topmost taxa for which we do behavior and biological surveillance. So we go to villages, we interview people, their risk, their activities. We collect blood both from animals, domestic wildlife and people and look at where exposure has been. We have got evidence in all these countries in Congo, even in West Africa. Before even this current Ebola outbreak happened, People had been exposed to the Ebola virus and they are showing titers in their serum. These kind of things would be known if this surveillance was going on. So that's what we were really looking at in this, this project. Behavior, looking at what you do if you go hunting. Well, you just, you will most likely go find a, no, an animal you think is normal and health and that's what you hunt for your food. But in some countries, a carcass is good enough. Somebody finds a dead carcass of an antelope, oh, I've got meat today. So we look at all those kind of things. And also activities. You, what do you do, your kind of activity? How much does it expose you? The project was really about that. We did a lot of training of people in terms of what to be aware of, especially sampling. The rangers, when they find a dead animal, they have to inform us, get samples, test those samples. Because some of these start with a single animal death, after two days, so many animals, so many animals, before you know, you are losing a huge herd of animals and that has happened a lot in our life. So in terms of conservation, it's important for us to know what's happening before something just was happening. Also biosecurity, you need to be safe. Somebody doesn't pick a virus by doing a post-mortem. So training on biosafety bio and biosecurity was important. We need to get equipment, labs and freezers and uh, testing materials to be able to run those samples. Then we went on with a trained group of people, partnerships as I've said, collect samples from those taxes as I've said, humanely by the way, don't need to kill a, an animal to get a sample. You can safely capture it, pick a sample, release go. So we did with mostly bats, as I've told you, rodents, you can just a small uh, my hematocrit tube, you don't need a huge 10 mil of blood to do a PCR test on this. Uh, so just a small, because of advance in science, we're able to get samples that would work with other animals, camels, because of the interest in mass, if you have heard about Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, largely from camels and Genji communities and doing those samples. We analyze samples on a gradient, what we call a gradient of anthropogenic disturbance. If we collect samples deep in windy versus on the next township, all the way up to Chisoro town of Musanze in those bats and what, what do we see in terms of viruses and virus uh, uh, distribution? Which viruses are there? in which animals, how do people get, to really inform us of any issues that might be, and from this we got really very interesting results, and it's true that the interaction, the more we interfere with the environment, has largely been responsible for most of our problems, health-wise. So we got so many findings, so many things, which I can't really present in, the, in an hour or so, but in Uganda, actually, we found a, a coronavirus, we found at least so far, 42 viruses that Mule discovered, described from the project that had never been known before. But among those is a coronavirus that currently is the most closely related to the mass coronavirus of the of, uh, Middle East. And that got it from a bad so, so the next work is to look at how does this, can, is it as effective to people as the mass coronavirus we know. And also for us to know where is the the other one came from in terms of because for Mabaga for, for Ebola for example we don't know the reserve up to today we have never found it so some of these workers are trying to find us where are the reserve where are source of these infections and so that contributes to to our understanding of some of these so we have this publication about bats for example we now know for sure are the natural reservoirs of the SARS like coronavirus SARS was a big issue previously and the 
this is information that we know. So next, how do we now safely live with the bats? We are not going to go and kill, exterminate all of bats. We know the importance of bats in, in pollination and in the environment. So that's the measure we need to give. So we have to advise, must deal with them. How do you deal with that? So predict, the project is called Predict Overall. It was in 32 countries across the world, all the way from Latin America, Southeast Asia. So Uganda was one of the 32 countries. And I was leading that project in Uganda. And to do that, as I've said, you need heavy partnerships. We have international partnership, as you said, USID, State Department, University of California, Davis is our mother institution, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Conservation Consortium, Equity Alliance, Smithsonian Institution. So we need researchers, we need scientists at all levels across the globe to make sense of this. Local also, we have our own partners, who is Wildlife Authority. They need to agree to what we are doing, even to publish some of this work. If you are going to get a publication and show the virus density of pathogen is in windy, who might think this is going to scare away tourists? So to get our partners to buy in and agree to some of these is what was key to some of our work. And so just my last message to you, when we think about all of this, you will realize that we have problems we are trying to address, be it a pathogen, be it a zoonotic disease, be it a conservation problem. Well, these gorillas are few, how do we get their numbers up? But in all of that, they are drivers, things which really drive that problem. Land use, when people went in and cut the forest, the gorilla habitat it went. Numbers linked. So when you can't address a problem, if you don't think about its driver, what do you think is the driver? Is another of what must you do? But also what are the influences? Culture. If people's culture is to eat primate meat, and they are going to continue hunting these animals for food, you think you are going to address the conservation without looking at the influence and who who influences culture, poverty, economics, behavior, education, all these things make a difference. So for us as a project, we know this very well and that's why we look, do and so many partnerships like uh, the world's here to make sense and contribute to each of these angles to solve a, uh, what we think is a disciplinary problem. So we said transdisciplinary problem require coordinated and transdisciplinary solution. That's my message for you. And with that, I think we can make a difference in whatever angle, whatever problem we are trying to tackle. And no group can do it alone, but just partnerships. Thank you. Yes. similar to yours, or mm -hmm. when you uh, work with uh, the varieties of uh, species of mm -hmm. animals. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, tips uh, that, uh, for, for, for me personally, mm -hmm. about uh, going into that career? Yeah, yeah, it's that I exactly started the same way you were asking. I was a very student. In fourth year class, we have a five year course, and one of the Goya doctors then gave a presentation to our university. At the end of the presentation, I asked him, I was inspired, and like, how do I get involved? Then he told me, he asked me, as a vet student in our university, we are required to make a, a, a special project, a project you work on and give, present, give a dissertation, present a dissertation. So he told me, what project are you thinking about working on? And so we engaged in that program and it connected me to the advisor. The most important thing was to find the advisor. Which other faculty member in the university has interest in wildlife and is willing to be my advisor if I chose a project to solve or to work on in the wildlife. And that's how it started. So I got an advisor, encouraged me, wrote a concept and something I want to work on. Good enough was again funded by the Goya doctors, they, they funded the work, uh, the, the research component. And that's how I started and my interest came into wildlife. But when I graduated, again, the Wildlife Authority, equivalent to Park Service, US Fish and Wildlife, yeah, they were advertising for jobs of rangers, wardens, rangers, game rangers, protection, enforcement, and as a vet, I thought, well, do I fit in this kind of job? But why not? When I looked at what they want, 
I thought I had it on the other end that I joined the wildlife for thought it as a ranger basically or a warden a manager. But well because I was a vet already when I was at work, I would want to to do veterinary skills or practice. If an animal was sick, I would be interested and go in. If there was a postmodern to do, I would do it. And we were working with Goyla doctors in collaboration because the wildlife father was not had it did not have its own personnel to do the veterinary care but relying on groups like Goya doctors for gorillas and that's how our collaboration starts. So it starts with interest, starts with identifying of a, a professor, a faculty who has similar interest and build a relationship, think about a problem you want to solve because you must add, you must add to the solution. If you come to join, you must really contribute your concept, your proposal, your idea is contributing, solving a problem. What are our current main problems when we talk of gorilla health? Then you come with a concept that we think we are giving us an answer, or at least contributing. That's how it starts. And I think if you have that in mind, in whatever species you think about, be it fish, be it any thing you think about in your life, it makes it, that's how it starts. And that's, I think, it's not about change. Yeah. There was another question, yes. So you said that your efforts are uh, in, in causing a growth in, mm. the, in the mountain gorilla population, about mm. 4% per year. Yeah. Do you have an idea of when you might hit that maximum for the, for the, the size of the habitat <laughs> Yeah, we are currently, actually this year, in July, we launched uh, a big project with our other partners to look at carrying capacity. We are going to address, to assess the carrying capacity of wind mugaing of this conservation area, not only in Goya numbers, but also in other aspects of tourism and uh, socioeconomic, uh, we call it uh, socioeconomic, how is the socioeconomic being of the people uh, surrounding the park and the increase in the population, how is it going to affect whatever we are doing? In as much as we increase the gorilla numbers, but if the local people remain poor and they are not supportive of any effort, so there is a big project which are going to add many, many aspects, and that's going to build into what we call a PHVA, Population and Habitat Viability Assessment. So we are going to assess all aspects of that, including the population, how much can it be, viability, can this forest support it? What about other influencers? As I've said, there will be influencers, there will be drivers, and there will be problems. So what about others? So that question, as of now, in fact, we don't know. Only one person has done that, PHVA, in the, before, that was 1997. There are so many years since. We have always tried to answer that question. People are saying, but the number seems to be increasing. Why are you worried? Saying no, we still need to know how far can we go before we are hit. In any case, maybe we need to know what we have done well and therefore what we need to do now to not lose track and also to commit people. We have so many people working in ecology and behavior, tourism, community well being, community welfare. If we do, we call it a species action plan. With the, and we know this is the plan for the gorillas. Then in a group, in an individual, be it a donor, be it a fan, be it a researcher, I want to come and do work that things is contributing to that. It's going to be committed to work within the framework of the species conservation plan that we have developed. And that is going to come after the, what we call a PHV, a population and habitat viability assessment. So as of now, we don't know how many can be there, but we are just embarking on that work right now. Yeah. Yes, please. Do you have uh, concerns about genetic diversity among any population? Yes, we have. One of the main ones, we have had researchers, especially researchers are very inquisitive and they normally throw, and that's fine, I question when you come to do research. Some, we have researchers, we collaborate with them, they are doing a gen, 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 a gorilla genome. They say, okay, we have a population in, a viru, in a Virunga and a population in Buindi. Are they the same? How long have they been separated? So genetics work, and with advance in genetic knowledge, all those can be answered. So for now, we have a good genetic mix 
of the individuals in the population level. So we are not concerned yet about the genetics composition and mix up of the goyas within Buinda and within Mugainga. And also the research, that paper is actually in review. Uh, is, is it has shown, it still continues to show the same what we knew, that these are the same people that were separated mostly by people who came and settled within those corridors. And then we had also elephants moving across. Until recently, actually, elephants were still going through the Virunga side, Sarambwe side. But yeah, I think for now we are not really concerned. We have seen genetic effects in smaller populations. Say, lion is in Queen Elizabeth National Park. In the southern sector of the park, we have started to see genetic effects or defects related to interbreeding and a closed population. That has not yet been seen in the Goyas yet. We've seen some syndactyly, but I don't know if that has anything to do with genetics. So. We kind of are following it and, and saying when we find an animal that has two toes that are put together, but it doesn't yeah. affect them. In yeah. Way. Yeah. Do you see syndactyly in Bwindi? Mm, not yet. Yeah, we haven't so seen. We haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Yes. I, I have a question about your relationship with the local governments in terms of mm. when, when you're doing your work and you're trying to impact policy. Mm. Do you have someone in your organization that's like designated to interact with the politicians? Actually, we that's an area we rarely, rarely go into. We normally restrict ourselves to the wildlife authority. Any message you want to pass on, we want it to be passed on by the wildlife authority. They are the custodians, they are the mandated institution to influence policy. We can't be seen as a group that is going to bring a policy that may be controversial, acceptable here or there. So we normally restrict ourselves to information through the wildlife authority. And there is a forum, we have a forum. Every year we meet a uh, partners forum. Different institutions, you present what you do. And so that forum we share information. And even that forum, uh, information, I mean, ideas are generated and agreed upon across partners. And that it makes it even easier. So in as much as we have uh, ideas or we want to pass, one of the examples I would give is uh, the revenue sharing. We show that goyas are bringing a lot of money. It's not going to be us to tell government that why don't you divert a portion of that money to the welfare of these communities here. You know, we're not going to be the one, but we know it. We will raise it in a forum like that, in the partners forum, and then the forum together with other partners are going to come and make a recommendation. That's going to be a, a good for us, for our own publicity. I think that's the way we, we have been doing it so far for now. And we'll be invited with other partners to discuss yeah, yeah. about controversial, mm. if there's a controversial mm. thing, like mm. the lift in, in the Virungas. Yeah. Um, we'll be invited to meetings, but it's, mm. it's, a, it's a partner's meeting yeah. and information. We give our piece of the information. Yeah. And you are not held responsible for it because we don't make the final decision. If there's going to be a new road cut or something, we'll give our opinion why we think it's good or bad. Is the government to buy it or not? But we cannot again be held by by saying we didn't we don't do the road but if we give we are give us the opportunity to participate in all debate concerning anything to do with with the goyla habitat and it's a entire ecosystem okay well let's have a round of applause <laughs> Uh, we still have some snack food up here, anybody that's hungry. <laughs> so I'm here with Dr. Jan Raymer. So what's your doctorate in? I'm a veterinarian, so I, I went to vet school and i um, a veter veterinarian by training. And so you work at the wilds now, right? I am at the wilds. I started at the wilds in 2015 as the director of conservation medicine, and two years ago transitioned to the vice president position. Now I'm the director of the wilds. Dr. Bennett Sibidi, so from the presentation today, how did you like the um, the amount of people that came and felt so, so the energy of it, of it? Yeah, I think it was very positive. I got an audience I almost didn't expect, and also seeing the students pick interest and listening attentively and uh, picking interest in doing what we are doing or becoming what we are. I think is very encouraging and is, that's what we always look forward for. We really need to encourage and motivate the students and they also play part in the conservation of, of our world. Well that's awesome and uh, how did you get into the veterinarian area? 
I studied vet medicine first of all. My father was a medical doctor, but I like they wanted to do something different. I saw vets were cool. They were dealing with many animals which don't speak, don't talk, and I was like, how do they do it with a human patient? It's going to tell you I'm sick, I'm feeling A, B, C, D, and you maybe treat based on what they tell you and what you diagnose. But with animals, you got to find a different way of doing it. So I thought vets were cool and special in that they have the ability and the skills to treat animals which don't speak, don't talk. And and can describe their illnesses. So you've that, been around this your entire life then? Yes, yes, def- yeah. My entire life I've been a vet. Yeah. Out of school, graduate, went to vet school up to now. Twenty years now, almost. Twenty years? Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. So what about um being the head of the field vet? How long have you been that for? I've been a field head vet for uh, for, for the last seven years. So what got you into doing the wilds? What what got you into doing this veterinarian area? Uh, I've been in zoos my whole career, and I was an animal keeper for many years, but what really got me into conservation medicine was when I went to Rwanda in 2009, and I was the regional manager for gorilla doctors, and I got to know the veterinarians working very hard for gorilla conservation in Rwanda, Congo, and Uganda. So how was that experience then? Oh, it was the most difficult but most rewarding experience of my life, to tell you the truth. Um, So how long did you spend spend your time there? I was there for almost four years and then came directly here to the wilds in 2015. Wow, that's quite a long time. It is. So, you know, from the presentation we saw today, how did you like the amount of people that were here and the energy they saw from people? Oh, I'm so pleased there were so many Muskingum students that were here today. Um, Dr. Bennard was uh, really excited to speak to these undergraduate students. So it was great to be in Uganda where, you know, we get to all experience all of this, um, you know, the gorilla conservation and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's great for me because... Uh, studying in Uganda, working on the Ugandan problem and uh, solving it if we can, yeah, makes me up about it and uh, I think it's, 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 it's all right for me really. So what's your goal um, for people to learn from this presentation then? Uh, every individual has a role to play. There are so many aspects when it comes to a conservation of gorillas or any other species, from the veterinary care and aspect to ecology and behavior, to communities that interact with those animals, to tourism, to sustainable resource use other resources. It's a multifaceted uh, issue. So I think everybody in his own discipline, vets, ecologists, researchers, scientists, uh, media, everybody definitely has a role to play. We present this we give presentation, we give information, but we are not the one who pass it on to the papers or write about it or even bring it to TV. So even the media is our major partner in passing on some of this information we are, we are giving. So for the students here, I think in their respective disciplines, everyone has a role to play, for sure. Well, the, I sure got some information that I like to hear, and I bet everyone else did as well. So glad you came to Muskegon University, and thank you so much for your services. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, too.